Systemic Interventions and Their Leverage, based on Donella Meadows' Hierarchy of Systemic Interventions. In this video, we're going to be looking at the range of interventions that are available and asking the question, do different interventions have different leverage for systemic change? Let's consider ways that you can intervene in the system. We begin by recalling Aristotle's model of causality, with each quadrant representing a different causality. As covered in the video on Aristotle's model of causality, the bottom half of this diagram represents the physical domain, or material reality. So what types of interventions can one implement in the material reality? Let's first choose a systemic problem. Let's take ourselves back to 1970 when farming in the U.S. was becoming less popular as a career path and it was becoming more lucrative to convert farmland to non-farming uses. What are interventions that could take place? Within the natural capital domain, one could increase the area of farmland that falls in the category of altering numbers, stocks, and flows. While that may temporarily provide more food, it does little to change the prospects of farming as a career. What about changing system rules? Another intervention could be around system rules. This is the intervention that was chosen to create federal government subsidies for farming commodities. Another intervention might be at the level of changing who has access to what information. An intervention at this level could have been an information campaign that brought together the information on how farming represented a stable career path, along with how to enter the farming occupation and get access to the needed resources. Another intervention could have been along lines of empowering self-organization. An example of that could have been regional hosted meetings where commodity farmers met and worked together to make clear their current challenges and address those together. An additional intervention could have been in redefining goals. At this level, one might begin to ask questions about the food system. What was the relationship of industrial commodity farming to a stable food supply? Is the goal of stabilizing industrial commodity farming equivalent to the goal of ensuring that the U.S. could feed its people? As a final area of intervention, we could have questioned our paradigms within our intent. What were they? One was a paradigm of economy of scale, where there is a cost savings when something is manufactured at large scale. If we looked at this paradigm, we could have seen that there is also a cost to the economy of scale model of farming. Centralized farming embeds the need for a shipping system to all parts of the country, embedding a great deal of petroleum in the food chain. Was this the best approach? Are there other models of regional food systems that could have been encouraged instead of centralized industrial farming? So these levels of interventions mapped against Aristotle's model of causality are not equal in their impact. These intervention levels proposed by Donello Meadows have a hierarchy in terms of their impact. In this diagram, the leverage of the impact is represented by the size of the dot. Let's look at these in a different way. In this figure, the intervention levels are laid out on a lever arm to emphasize the fact that the intervention levels have different leverages. As can be seen, the highest leverage resides in transcending paradigms. The lowest leverage is in the material domain. As an example, consider the sinking of a, the Titanic ship. There's a famous reference to rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. This aphorism refers to the fact that the material cha changes do little to change the systemic conditions. The act of moving from the material cause to the final cause is equivalent to expanding the boundaries of the problem to include more opportunities for interventions. Within the material cause, the opportunities are material things. Expanding the boundaries to include efficient cause or processes includes processes. Expanding it to include formal cause includes system goals. Further expanding to consider final cause begins to ask questions about our relationship to the problem that is trying to be fixed. Who are we in this system? 
Here's an example. In the United States, the majority of electricity is generated through burning coal. At some point, engineers designed the system to provide the needed electricity. However, what was missed in the designing of the system is that burning coal results in a constant stream of biotoxins emitted to air, water, and land. Was it the intent of the designers to poison living beings? Most likely their intent was to create a reliable source of electricity. What if the intent instead had been to ensure the safety and well-being of society? Would the energy system that was designed be the same if the main intent was the safety and well-being of society? Or maybe the coal burning system would include efforts to remove toxins from the effluent stream. This example illustrates how examining the intent serves as a powerful intervention in a system by shifting where one's attention lies in the decision-making process. According to Don Meadows, not all interventions are equal in their potential for systemic change. Interventions in the physical domains have less leverage for systemic change. Interventions in the relational domain have higher leverage. The highest leverage comes from being able to transcend paradigms. For more information on systemic interventions, see Don Alamedo's book, Thinking in Systems, a Primer, by Chelsea Green Publishing.